Here we go. And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. John 9, verses 37 and 38. Let's do it again. And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. John 9, verses 37 and 38. Good morning, everybody. I am not Joy. Womp womp. Again, <laughs> sorry to disappoint you. Uh, you know, what a sacrifice, and I hope she's watching because, gosh, to be in Hawaii, you know, someone's got to do it, so it might as well have been Joy and Bill. But no, and all kidding, kidding aside, please keep them in prayer. Uh, traveling can be exhausting, and as you know, um, you're never... You're never like not met with resistance, right? Whenever you go out to do something for the Lord, the enemy is trying to divide and to cause um, issues. So please keep them in prayer um, that there would be a time for joy to rest, for Bill to rest, but also that they would minister. What a great way for them to enjoy some time off and also be a light in that island, right? So really excited for them. But we... Mainlanders, we're here, so <laughs> we are in chapter uh, 9 of John. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come today, Lord, uh, just thankful for this opportunity to gather together and to together open your word. Um, may your words today just bring comfort. May it bring healing. May we be uh, just shown the light Father, uh, the light of your truth and the light of your word. Um, I pray that you would uh, shove me out of the way and just let your spirit move and speak to us today and that um, you go before us. And I ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we are continuing from last week's study in chapter 8, where Jesus, we know, was in Jerusalem during the uh, Feast of the Tabernacles. And the Pharisees have attempted to stone him. Because he said, before Abraham, I am, which was a very pointed way of him saying, I am God. Uh, he hid himself and walked out of the temple through the midst of them and just slipped right on out. Moving into chapter 9 today, we'll see that Jesus says he is the light of the world and brings sight to a man who has lived his life up until this point in utter darkness. Uh, but more importantly, he is bringing light to the eyes of the heart of this man. It is the only recorded miracle of a person who received sight from being blind since birth in the Bible. The man's eyes are opened. His heart is also open. And it's the testimony, right, of every believer that comes to Christ. I was blind, but now I see. So it's an amazing uh, passage in scripture. And this man will see is pressed and asked several times uh, to share how this miraculous change happened in his life. And uh, with each response, it's really neat, we witness his faith increase. So verse 1, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents has sinned, but the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind, blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seen. This portion of scripture starts with Jesus passing by. And I know in the homework we talked about, or it was in the homework, like he just is about to get stoned and he's just passing by. He's not running. He's just passing by. And it's interesting because keep in mind that we're about to stone him, yet he's moved by compassion for this man. 
presenting a very unique opportunity for those that follow Jesus, his disciples, to ask this question of sin, assuming that his condition had been part or as a result of something that deserved this man being in that situation. A common misconception that occurred during that time. This man's situation would actually be the space in where God's work and glory would be revealed. So God uses our circumstances to showcase his glory. We don't always understand why God allows certain things to happen in our life, but we know that God can work through any of it, right? Of course, uh, it does, uh, does actually bring to understanding that there are times that sin in our life does bring about consequences, right? So yes, sin may not have caused this man, but there are things that we set into motion by our choices of sin that do bring about consequences. Not all bad situations are a direct result of it, but in this case, it's a very important teachable moment that Jesus um, is saying that it's not anyone's sin, but really the sinful nature of the world. Often our situation and circumstance is the vessel in which our testimony is to be shared. How we walk, how we come out through that situation allows us to showcase God's glory. I don't know if many of you know Nick Vujicic. I think I said that right. Close enough, Nick V. It's so funny because that's what his ministry is called, Nick V Ministry. (laughs) Uh, formerly known as Life Without Limbs. Does anybody know this man? He, he, he has no limbs. Um, he's a worldwide evangelist. He was born without any medical explanation or warning about him being wo- born without any arms or legs. He was led to know and understand that God had a plan to work through him after coming to Christ, reading John chapter 9 at seven years old. When invited to speak at a public high school, there was a group of sophomores, 300 sophomores that he was able to speak to. And there was a girl in the front that was weeping while he was talking. She was just overcome with, you know, sadness. And she interrupted him and said, can I come up and speak with, uh, can I come up and give you a hug? I just need to give you a hug. And so as she came up, she told him, no one's ever told me that they love me. No one's ever told me that I'm beautiful the way that I am. And he's quoted saying, at that moment, I knew God was ministering to her through me. It was not my speech. It was not my speech or my power. It was God. It was an awesome day to see one soul transformed forever. That's when I uh, knew I was called to be a worldwide evangelist. In those seven initial years, he had 2,000 appearances. He spoke in 44 countries and six continents. And he says, if God can use a man without arms and legs to be his hands and feet, then he will certainly use any willing heart. Right? Amazing. In verse 6, if there's anybody's spit that we would like accept on our face... (laughs) I think it would be Jesus's, right? Uh, Let's agree it's very unconventional, right? Um, But God works differently in the lives of different people, right? So if you think about it, some he healed remotely, right? When he uh, said, go, you're healed, or go, your son is healed. Um, Others by laying hands, and others by just speaking the word. Praise God for that, (laughs) right? So maybe... Uh, He did this so that he couldn't be accused of being a one-trick pony, right? Where they say, oh, he always heals people because he's got uh, something that's staged, or maybe he's got some kind of potion, and that's what causes him to heal these people. But also, keep in mind that God created the earth from dirt. He created Adam from the earth. So only God himself could yet make another miracle from the dirt and the dust that man was created from, showing God's divine power and authority over creation. We don't know why he did it, but thank God he did. And he could do anything in any life. The beggar, though, had to take steps in obedience and in trust. Even though Jesus did the work, 
right? He did the miracle. The man had to walk in faith, blind faith. He was given instructions, and he said, go to the pool of Siloam. The pool of Bethesda was closer, but he had to walk, depending on where Jesus came out from, he had to walk between a quarter mile to a half mile with that on his face, going down uh, steps to wash. Can you picture that? Blind and like with stuff on his face and going down steps, and I'm sure everyone's like, what is going on? Like, does he know he has that on his face, right? But to God, the end result is important. But so is the process. Because it's in the process where we grow and learn, where our faith is strengthened. He gets down to Siloam and comes up with sight. The vividness, think about the rushing of colors and the textures and the lights and the birds that he only heard of when they were bothering him or the clouds or the trees, the rustling of the trees as the wind goes through them. That just came rushing into his eyesight. Could you just imagine? It's incredible taking in the beauty of creation, experiencing a world that he was already in, yet experiencing a world for the first time in some other ways. When we come to Christ, whether we are um, someone that's coming to the Lord for the first time or someone that walks away and comes back to the Lord, we are given new eyesight, right? Right? We see things with a different perspective. Our spiritual eyesight goes from maybe 10, 10 to 20, 20, right? And so do we often take it for granted, both our physical and our spiritual sight? Are we excited about the new perspective that Jesus gives us? It was the same world, but he would be living it so differently from this point forward. Verse 8, therefore the neighbors and those who had previously had seen that he was blind said, is this not this he who was sad and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he's like him. He said, I am he. (laughs) Therefore, he's like, I'm blind, I'm not deaf, I'm telling you because I'm here. Uh, Therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. (laughs) The neighbors and others that were around him uh, had previously seen him, probably didn't really know him. It looks like him. It kind of sounds like him. But this guy can't see, so it's not him. Because the other guy was blind. Think about it, as a beggar, he was probably overlooked, maybe invisible to those who passed him by every day. We know that he was invisible to the Jewish leaders until the day this happened, until the day this miracle changed his life. But maybe his countenance had changed. He had met with Jesus And as we follow Jesus and we get into a deeper relationship with Jesus, our countenance changes. We don't appear the same to those who knew us before because we are different, right? Amen. I love that. Yes. In verse 12, at this point, he knows so little about Jesus. When he's asked, he clearly doesn't even know what he looks like. Think about it. Yet he's in the beginning of his growing faith and of his allegiance to Jesus. Verse 13, they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. And now it was Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had seen, received his sight. He said to them, he put clay on my eyes. I could just see the attitude. Like He put clay on my eyes. I already told them. He put clay on my eyes and I wash and I see. End of story. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. Then they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. He said, he's a prophet. 
But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he see now? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means now he sees, we don't know. Or who opened his eyes, we don't know. He's of age, ask him. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So Jesus, the Sabbath breaker, um, again, by no coincidence, in chapter 5, he heals the lame man on a Sabbath. Um, and according to Jewish tradition, putting any mixture together, creating a bomb, creating a clay, um, really was not allowed. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to contradict this rule. And once again, he challenges those man-made Sabbath rules. If you were here on Sunday, you heard uh, or heard Pastor Shaddy talk about these fence laws. These were laws to protect the people from the actual laws of God, but they had become so restrictive for them to actually live. And Jesus is saying, hey, I didn't, I'm, I didn't mean for those rules to be difficult for you to live life. Similar to the misconception of the man having been blind because of his sin, he's making the distinction that Sabbath is a day to do good. And what God intended, which is what he himself is doing here, he's doing good. In verse 16, we see that it stirs up division among them. Consider what their arguments and counter-arguments are. Well, he didn't keep the Sabbath, okay, but he just healed a blind man. Yeah, but he didn't keep the Sabbath, the dude can see. Like, you know, does God not often confront us with the realizations that are rational and sound or people that bring wisdom into our life, yet we allow ourselves to be blinded by our own stubbornness or thinking? So they go back to the man to get his take because the two, between the two groups, they can't figure it out. And they can't get a consensus. And then the man calls him a prophet. But that was too ridiculous of a title for him. So they figured, go get his parents. His parents. Go get his parents because this is just, you know, we need to confirm that he was blind to begin with. Because now it's just a whole ruse to get the people confused. So the Teflon parents come. The Teflon parents, because they don't want his testimony to stick to them. So they're like, you ask him. He's of age. Um, and their fear, their fear crippled them it outweighed their sense of protection for their son. They're rejoicing in his newfound vision. Instead, they distanced themselves from him because they were more concerned about maintaining their good standing in the community of worshipers. The respect from others was more important than the truth, and they didn't want to face the consequences of it. Imagine being more concerned about a meeting place than meeting the one who radically changed the life of your child, who has been a beggar his whole life. Make it make sense. <laughs> when you want to reject Jesus, though, isn't it true that when you want to reject Jesus, any excuse will do? It doesn't take much to convince yourself that the excuse is good enough. Verse 24, so they called the man again who said was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, <laughs> I love it. Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. <laughs> One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see amazing grace, right? He then said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you don't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> I just love that part. I'm like, you go blind. Well, man that could see now. Um, then they reviled and said to him, you are his disciple. But we are disciples of Moses or Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he's from. The man answered and said to them, well, this is a marvelous thing 
that you do not know where he's from, yet he's opened my eyes. Now we all know, now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, I just love that he's like, since the beginning of time, (laughs) it has been unheard that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, how could he, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins and you are teaching us. And they cast him out. (laughs) So desperate, so desperate to uncover wrongdoing in this miracle and push this guy to tell them what they wanted to hear that each time he comes back to the point that Jesus healed him from his blindness. The more they talked, the more they they tried to get him to talk, the more convinced he was that Jesus was from God. And his miracle was undoubtedly from God. Unashamed, unafraid to speak the truth, and in stark contrast to his parents. Whether he's a sinner or not, all I know is I have my sight. And I'm not going to debate this. We can go on and on and on. But one thing I know for sure is I could see. I could see you right now. I could see your face. You're not happy, but I don't care. He doesn't care. I love that. He wasn't an educated man since he was blind, and we know he was a beggar. Yet he presents a great argument. And I love that he's like, do you want to just follow him too? I mean, I'm going to probably go find him. You guys want to just come? We could carpool, (laughs) you know? (laughs) God doesn't require a doctorate or a master's in theology or Bible discipline uh, to understand him and his word. He provides wisdom to those who seek it and ask of him. We just need to ask Luke 21, 14 through 15 says, Therefore settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all of your adversaries adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. God was in that situation with that man. He was being pressed and pressed and seeing his parents like, Hey, hey, take him. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. He's like, I don't care. Let me tell you, he healed me. The man knew that only someone sent by God could do such things, and a sinner couldn't be heard by God. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Their arrogance and unbelief led them to reject Jesus and the miracle altogether and told him, by the way, don't school us. Um, There's nothing you could ever teach us. You're a sinner, and so is Jesus, and you're out of here. And they made him a persona non grata. You're not welcome here. But we should never be unteachable. 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord? Lord that I may believe in him. And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Verse 35 is just so tender because Jesus was searching for him. He heard and he knew that he had been an outcast and he went looking for him exiling this man out of the synagogue and making him an outcast among men brought this man straight into the presence of Jesus and he was embraced by him. Psalm 27 10 when my father and my mother forsake me then the Lord will take me up. As the leaders of the Jews they should have protected him. As his parents they should have protected him. His, fa- his father and his mother should have been the first ones to say, this is the biggest miracle that's ever happened in our life. We've suffered. My son has suffered. Instead, they turned their back on him too. But he landed in the arms of the great shepherd. The one who leaves the 99 for that one. Each step that this man took from the steps to Siloam through the questioning of those around him, was directing him closer and closer to the arms of Jesus. 
in front of Jesus now, he called him into faith. Jesus says, he pointedly asked him, where do you believe? What's, what's your belief? Telling him that he not only had seen him, so, hey, you got a new set of eyes, so you've seen him, you've experienced him with your new senses, but you've also spoken with him. This man went from um, Jesus declaring Jesus to be a man to declaring Jesus to be a prophet to being sent by God to saying, Lord. He worshiped Jesus and Jesus received it. The Jewish leaders had essentially said, you can't worship with us in the temple. And in turn, Jesus gave his, this man direct access to worship. What a beautiful sight that must have been to, for him to be able to experience that and say, I don't care about going to the synagogue. I'm looking at the face of God. Incredible. Verse 39, and Jesus said, for judgment I've come into this world that those who do not see may see and that those who may be, that see may be blind. Then some of those, some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see. Therefore, your sin remains. Jesus is telling them that because you claim to know me, but you reject me, you really don't know me. I'm standing right in front of you, and you're rejecting me, so you don't know who I am. The religious leaders insisted that because they could see in the world, they could see spiritual things. And we often, don't we not, and you have to agree, that we often need to prove to ourselves that we're right, and we desperately sometimes are, that is the area where we're desperately in need of God's vision. God opens our blindness to the areas that are either blind spots or complete loss of sight for us. Things that we are brought into understanding only after lifting the veil of unbelief or uh, lifting the veil of stubbornness in our life. In Proverbs 26, 12 do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than him. Ladies, may it be our prayer that those who are blind to the things of God may see and those who claim they know and see God and those that don't would definitely just understand how blind they really are. Don't stay in the dark about Jesus and the things of God. We are living in a time where there is just so much spiritual darkness that God calls us to be the light and he calls us to stand out in the midst of that darkness. And may that be our prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for this amazing story of this man that has just undeniable faith and is just so bold Lord, even in the midst of, it, of adversity, Lord, may we learn to be like him and may we stand in the face of darkness and speak your truth, Lord. I pray that um, you continue to do a work in our hearts, that you would expose those areas that we are blind to and that we would have spiritual eyes, Lord, to see those things that maybe we refuse to see because we're making excuses for it, Lord. I pray that you go before us today and that you would... Um, be with us during the small groups, Lord, and that you would get everybody home safely. Uh, we praise you and we thank you because you are faithful and you are the same in this story. You're same today and you're the same forevermore. I ask you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus. Thank you for listening to this Heart to Heart Women's Bible Study recorded at Refuge Calvary Chapel in Huntington Beach. We hope you've been encouraged by today's lesson and will join us again as we continue to study through the Word of God. For more information about the Heart to Heart Women's Ministry, please visit our website at www.refugefamily.com 
or call our office at 714-891-9495. Giving up, letting go.